I'd like to call to order the work session on August 19, 2019. I'm, uh, we are all present this evening. Now, uh, Vice Mayor Stiff is going to be calling in, so he will not be at the work session, all right? So let's go on to the first item. This information from staff on excessive plan reviews in the Engineering and Development Services Department. Of course, presenting is Re Rebecca Zook, Engineering Director. Thank you, Mayor and Council Members. It's a pleasure to be here at our first day back after our break. I'm very happy to have the opportunity to present this evening. Um, we are here this evening to present about a, a excessive plan review and substandard submittals. And when I say we, I'm referring to my team members that are sitting in the first row behind me. We have Randy, Steve, and Katie, all three of which are managers in the development continuum that you've all met before numerous times. Um, together, uh, they essentially make up um, team members that are intertwined as we move through a process with a customer to gain permits for construction and then eventual CFO. So it's very critical um, and they're heavily involved in this process. This evening, we're going to uh, cover sort of our analysis into excessive plan review. And what we meant by that was anything over three reviews. We're gonna go into ultimately what kind of impacts that has on our system and how detrimental that can be to the flow of the process. And then we'd like to talk a little bit about the future state. Where do we wanna be with respect to plan review? Then I'm gonna jump back a little bit and then talk. Can you push that a little yes. bit closer to the table? Thank I've you. never had you say that to me before. <laughs> wow. Um, and then we're going to um, talk about what we've done within the continuum to improve the, the overall process and then ask, uh, have some answers about how our customers might be able to help us uh, gain a little bit uh, more forward motion. And then finally, we're seeking guidance from council and policy direction on, on our recommendation. As I stated, um, uh, we started with um, an issue related to fourth and fifth reviews. And I'll give a head nod to Council Member Pizzillo. He originally brought this up and I very much appreciate him because it is an issue that we have on um, projects that extend into those, um, what we call excessive plan reviews. When we really started analyzing it though, we realized that it wasn't so many of the ones that went into fourth and fifth review, that was one symptom, but another symptom was the time it took us to review plans. And what I mean by that is we estimate that, and I'll just give an example for engineering sheets, it might take us an hour to review every sheet. When the plans come in of poor quality, it could take us two or three hours to review a plan set. So it really bogs down the overall system when we're looking for more type coordination issues. Um, we had um, looked at this and with that being some various symptoms and then trying to figure out, okay, how can we address poor plan reviews? And uh, I had come up with this idea that I thought was grand I was thinking, well, let's see, on the first review it'll come in and then we are going to, um, we'll know right away if it's a bad review. <coughs> so we're gonna reach out to our customers and our engineers and we're going to uh, send them a letter, a formal letter to say, hey, we reviewed these plans and they're of poor quality, whatever that is, a number of uh, comments, et cetera. And then sort of give them a heads up. If it comes in on the second review, and it is similar in that it still hasn't improved greatly, we'll then call a meeting with our customer and um, be that the owner and the engineer and really sit down and have a conversation about um, the opportunities and the tools that we've provided. And then if it comes to third review, that's when we would um, charge additional fees. So I had this idea and I think I mentioned to you that I wanted to go before the development forum, and that is a um, group of our developers. It happens quarterly. We talk about various things. Um, we talked uh, 
about the code updates. We'll talk about changes in um, processes. Uh, we'll talk about times that um, it takes us to review plans, whether we're changing additional requirements, updates and things like that. Well, in this particular meeting, I, I threw this idea out and it was a resounding, no, Rebecca, that's not gonna work. And what they came back, and it was, it was one person, then two, then three, is it was essentially kick the plans out if they're bad. It was just a, hey, we don't want, if I spend time with my engineer and we do a good job, we don't want it elongated our time in the system by plans that are bad. Just kick those bad ones out and tell them, come back later when you're better. So we were like, okay, well, that's very interesting. So that sort of started us on a, a, different, a different trend because I wanna listen to our customers. We want to do what is beneficial to all of us. And in the end, this is gonna address our concerns about poor quality submittals. So let me just um, jump a little bit into the various pieces of the process. So you've probably seen something like this when we walk the continuum. So we have preliminary plans that are submitted. So that's one place plan reviews occur, and that's Katie's area. Then we have engineering plans that are submitted after the planning uh, portion is approved, and then building plans. Those are submitted typically simultaneously. Engineering goes to Steve's group, building goes to Randy's group. And so at each one of those junctures are the opportunity for plans to come in that are poorly coordinated. <coughs> So our goal, again, with getting these through the process as quickly as we can is to, as you can see, the green begins permit issuance, construction, and then C of O. So we wanna get through that piece as quickly as we can. And so I just wanna describe a little bit about the type of plans that are coming in. And I know these are some extravagant cases, but it, when we review plans, we're looking for coordination type issues. We're making sure that uh, we had one example where we had building plans coming in and engineering plans coming in and those two essentially are married to each other, but there were different size buildings on the overall set. And you might say, well, oh, that's just, you know, the square footage just decreased that, but it impacts where the water and sewer tie in it impacts the, the overall <coughs> drainage of the site, potentially the parking area, parking spaces, things of that nature. And so it's really critical that we help our customer um, get to the success of a permit issuance, but those types of um, reviews are taking time away from when we can really focus on the technical type of stuff. And and just a, a tiny aside is that when we, the reason for plans, construction plans, is so that when they get in the field, the contractor knows exactly what to do. Now they're gonna run into things in the field that, that are just unexpected. But our job is to make sure we do the very best with clear and concise plans so that not only is the uh, the bid or the payment by the customer to the contractor accurate, but that they know exactly what they're gonna do because as soon as something is wrong in the field, then it ultimately hits back to the owner who's saying, oh, your plans were wrong, you know, that's gonna be this fee for a change order or something like that. So um, our desired future state is we want less time, that's less time for us as a plan reviewer we wanna help the engineer and architect so it's less time for them in preparing the plans. And ultimately that's gonna be less cost to the owner. We want to be able to focus on those technical items and not on the coordination efforts. I don't wanna to have to make sure that the water and sewer on those plans matches what's on the paving plans. That shouldn't be what I'm looking for but if I don't look for those and they get out in the field and then all of a sudden it's, it's like this and our inspectors are like, I, I don't know which one. Um, and then ultimately we would love to be able to have approval on second review because the faster we can get a project reviewed, approved and completed 
is the sooner we're going to get that C of O, whether it's somebody's residential home or it's a commercial uh, project, a retail space, our goal is to get things done as quickly as we can effectively. And so this is where I'm just gonna jump back to who we are and why we're really even doing this and all the things we've been doing the last few years. We took some time to ask ourselves, who are we and why are we here? The entire development continuum of economic development, development services and engineering, we're here to build a better Goodyear, whether again, it's development or it's our capital program. We are here to build a better, greater Goodyear. We want to deliver outstanding customer service. We never want to stop learning. We want to value our customers' input. We make a lot of changes just because our, our customers reach out and say, hey, did you ever think of this? Such and such city does that. So really, we are trying to be responsive to our customers and really help them get through the process as quick as they can. And here's where I go with the never stop learning. So. The different things that we've done, I'll give one example of like our pre-application meetings. Um, several years ago, um, it was a meeting where everybody would come together. It would be your owner, possibly your engineer. You'd go into a meeting, you'd have fire, engineering, um, sometimes public works depending on it, um, development services building, and you tell us what you're going to do and we give you a path forward. In order to make that even clearer now, a couple days afterward, you get a, a guide um, uh, sheet that essentially says, based on what we heard you say, these are your next processes. Here's where you can go to our website to find the application. Here's the timeline that you're going to have. Um, here's where you can find fees. I mean, it just goes on and on about the process and what you can expect. And here it tells you, well, and if you're gonna do some engineering stuff, go to these checklists. It gives you all of the links to where you can go. So we like to call this the answers to the test. And so we try to really set you up for success. Um, when, I, when I refer to some of the checklists, this is a checklist of what you would be required to submit. We used to have um, submittals come in and they would be incomplete. You know, let's say there are 10 items they're supposed to drop off. They would drop off seven, we would take it in. A first review comment would be, hey, guess what? You're missing numbers three, seven, and nine. We cannot do a complete uh, review with that. It's automatically going to another review. So we try to set them up for success and we actually won't even accept it unless it's all there. If they can go run and a day later come back with that item, that's better. That's better for everyone, it's better for them. And then a site plan checklist. This essentially tells you, and I think this is like 10 pages long, if you're gonna submit a site plan, here's everything you're gonna need to show on your drawings. I mean, it literally goes down and tells you the item, it tells you where to find it in the engineering guidelines, and then when we make a comment later, we're gonna tell you exactly where it is in the engineering guidelines. So you could essentially use this. Now there's gonna be engineering judgment, there's gonna be some uniqueness, but this will get you 80% of the way there. And so we have numerous checklists like that to help our customers and we've been spending a lot of time putting that together so that we can help them through the process. Um, and then we also hold pre and post meetings whenever a customer wants. If they wanna meet with us before they submit or after they submit, we'll absolutely gladly meet with them. We also uh, hold post-mortem meetings, which is an internal meeting, and it's for us to discuss what went wrong on a particular project. We actually held one today. We had a situation come up and we wanted to sit down with everyone and it's not about blame, it's about identifying what happened and how we can improve the process. And then we're just continuing to examine and analyze processes. Again, we never stop learning. So as we turn to our customers, ask them to participate, we're still continuing to evolve. And then the biggest effort we have coming up, which I'm excited about, is our project docs upgrade, which we currently have planned for um, March of 2020. Uh, and it'll bring all uh, areas onto electronic plan review. 
you know, engineering's been doing it for about 10 years. Uh, build, um, building hasn't yet started, but they're very excited about it. And then planning, we do some partial. But this will be a huge um, benefit to our customers, to us, the coordination process. And it also has a customer portal that will make it easier for the customers. So the, it'll be an evolution but we'll be working with our customers to make that, um, that package roll out again, hopefully in about eight months. Um, now we're at the point where what can our customers do to help? So now I'm going to, um, again, with this um, idea of kicking plans out, how can they participate in that to make that better? First thing we would say is please trust the process. We do this day in and day out. You come in for a pre-application meeting. Many cities charge for that. We don't charge for that because we want everybody to come in into one room and learn about what the steps are for the process. That then, then you're gonna go to a planning phase of it. It might be a site plan. After you get approval from that, you're gonna go to construction documents. And once you do that, you need to get approval of those. Then you're gonna pull your building permit, but you can't pull your building permit until your grading's done because you need something to put your building on. And so it's so on and so on. There's a whole process of the way that we do things and we just want them to trust us in, in, walk, in help, letting us walk them through that process in a, in a very um, seamless way. We're also asking our customers, and when I say customers in this one, I'm saying the owners, please be involved. We copy you on emails, you're in our project docs. When you go to the pre-app, or if, if you don't go to the pre-app, look at the notes. Look at our comments when we give you first and second review comments. We're always gonna cite if it's a second time. So if I make a comment on the first review, I make it again on the second review, I'm gonna say second request. Look at those go through the checklist with your engineer. Make sure that you allow them time to have uh, quality assurance, quality control before they submit. Make sure they're doing all that work that we're spending time coordinating on. Because again, what we'd love more than anything, and we know the customers want this too, is approval on the second review. Oh my gosh, I wouldn't even wanna talk about approval on the first review, but, um, but again, to, to be as quick as we can to help them. And be accountable, and what I mean by that is hold your engineers accountable. When you see that they haven't done something, have a conversation, why? Are you confused? If you're confused, did you call the engineering department? Did you call building? Did you have a conversation? Did you set up a meeting? We are always available. And finally, be inclusive. And what I mean by that is, if it's out for first review or second review and you make a change, that's okay, but tell us about it. Don't submit and then we open the plans because we're only gonna look at what we made a comment on. If all of a sudden we find that something's different, it's just like, okay, wait, what, what happened? Let us know ahead of time, have those conversations with us. Uh, and then um, let's see. So as I said, going back to what the development forum attendees recommended was to kick plans out. And that may seem simple at face value. But when we really started to dig into that, it was like, hmm, what does that really mean? And when should we implement it? I could start tomorrow. But then I wouldn't maybe be consistent. I wouldn't be making sure what is a poor uh, quality submittal. You know, we, so there's so many things that we need to define and work with our, um, our development community uh, to make sure that we understand and they understand because ultimately we want to set them up for success. We want them to have no questions about what we expect when it comes in. We wanna show them if they don't know where all these checklists are to help them out. So we want to, that, so that goes back to the implementation date, defining low quality plans. Then we, you know, what about that person that just keeps doing it over and over again, keeps submitting poor quality plans? How do we handle that? And then consistency, and this is really an important one that I, I need um, to stress. If we implement something like this, it will be consistent across all the projects that are submitted. And what I mean by that, and I'll just say that maybe there were a couple of our really high profile projects we've had in the last year that probably would have gotten kicked out. So I just, it's really important that we understand the, the, the gravity of that. 
And then finally, fee impacts. If there's anything that um, might impact fees, again, we heard my original one, which was definitely to, to um, impact the fees. This one may or may not, we haven't really looked at it. Would it happen on the third review? Just something like that. So we just really wanted to, um, to those are things we need to think about before we roll this out. And then finally, just in closing, um, I had an original proposal. We came back with a developer idea and um, now we're recommending that. It really seems like that gets us to where we want to be, which is to decrease the number of uh, poor performing plans coming in. And then we wanted to definitely touch back with council and find out if that is something you are interested in that you support but also we have our user fee study that we just started with finance this week. And if in fact, the option that we move forward uh, with does impact fees, we need to consider that as we go forward with the impact uh, with the user fees. <clears throat> so with that and in closing, um, we are seeking your policy direction on our recommendation and are happy to answer any questions you may have. There are points in time with that presentation I wanted to clap. <laughs> I didn't, but. Um, I think it's an excellent job you've done. I shouldn't be speaking first. I should pass it on, but I it just, I'm going to turn it over to Joe. And the reason I'm going to turn it over to Joe is because Joe asked for this and came up with this point. So I think he should be the first to speak. Joe? Oh, thank you, Mayor. Um, first of all, a uh, great presentation. Okay. And when I mentioned earlier the fees, I wasn't wed to those fees. I was trying to get exactly what you're trying to do is to reduce the number of poor reviews, that's all. Mm -hmm. And to be honest with you, um, I like your idea of what the developers came up with, but be honest with you, I didn't think they would ever suggest that, like you. Um, I think it's important for consistency, as you mentioned, whatever you roll out, it's gotta be consistent. And I kind of thought with those that were consistently doing four and five, they were using the city as their quality control assurance. Mm -hmm. So in other words, instead of going through all the checklists, they just submit it and figure, yeah, you're gonna catch it and send it back to us anyway, right? So that we got to avoid, because I also agree with what the developers had mentioned earlier. When you don't do that, you're holding up their jobs because you're taking unnecessarily your labor and spending it on those that you shouldn't be spending it on. So I, I like the idea of kicking out. Now, defining what that is, I'm going to leave it up to you to try to come up with that. Uh, under what you're proposing, I don't see where anything should go past third, because by the second is the goal third would probably for those really unique things mm -hmm. and if they can't get it right on the third maybe they got to go back and start all over again mm -hmm. okay uh, but I, I like what you've done I like the suggestions of developer developers and ultimately there are customers to an extent that you want to make sure that they're buying off on that but the same token we're in a really busy mode right now obviously with what's going on in your various departments and what we don't need is those taking advantage of those resources and hurting those that are doing it correctly. So I applaud what you've come up with. I really do. I liked uh, the study, the fact that you met with them. And I'm sure you were surprised when they come up with the answer they did, <laughs> as I was when, you, when, I, when I talked to the city manager. But again, consistency, and I, and I like the idea, and I appreciate the effort. Mm -hmm. Sherry? I'm going to echo, echo what council... Um, and Pizzillo stated, I, first of all, great presentation. It was very informative. It was very, very well done and gave us a lot of information. And what you said really did surprise me about that. That's what the developers kind of came back at. And I just have a couple questions. What percentage are the, would fall into this kind of like unacceptable category? Just so, ballpark. Uh, yes, thank you very much for that question. It's four, I'm sorry, five to 10% that fall into fourth and fifth. But what we realized we were doing was spending more time on those so they wouldn't go to fourth and fifth. And so it really is a larger problem than what is exhibited by the, num the percentages. Because you guys were doing a lot more babysitting, it sounds right. like, back and forth. And it sounds like you're willing to allow them to meet with you ahead of time before they submit and... And so I don't see with the checklist and with everyone meeting with them, if they have questions, why they should be coming back that many times. So I, I, I like your idea. And I think I agree with Joe that, you know, with regard to what consists that, that's probably your wheelhouse, not mine. But I, I think you guys have a good handle on it. And then one other question, when you do switch over to the electronic format for mm -hmm. everyone, 
if they don't have everything, will it not even accept it? Like if I don't attach, I'm not sure how that's going to work, but will it just like kick it out right then and there and say, we, we won't accept it because you didn't do everything? We actually have a step in the process that is called administrative review and it comes in and we'll look at those items and there may be, it may be something very important like a traffic study. And we might say, yeah, I'm sorry, we're gonna just leave it in there until you upload. Um, they may say, gosh, can I move forward? I'm gonna get it in three days. We may say, okay, I mean, it kind of depends, but we actually have an opportunity. The system won't kick them out. We'll actually look at it and see if it meets and how, how large of an impact it would have. But we really try to be consistent because again, that just takes time up in the system. And if, if we have to allow people to add on later, it's, you know, these seven project added on later, these three did not. So it, it really helps to maintain consistency through the process. Okay, thank you, no, great presentation. Thank you. Any other? Yes, Molly? Well, thank you, Rebecca. I wanna thank you for the very thoughtful um, process that you are putting together. Um, I think that will be very helpful. Uh, I think uh, no matter what we do, we're going to have those folks who uh, aren't as thorough as our staff is, and they're going to submit things that perhaps they miss. Um, are we building this program to put the plans online, or is it already a program we're just buying? It's a program that we actually have. So Project Docs is what we have used for 10 years. And so we're just gonna roll it out into the different areas. Okay, is it the most up to date? Um, I mean, is there anything that's any better on the market that we need to be looking at that would perhaps help you with these processes? Cause you know, you buy a computer today and it's out of date tomorrow. And it's gotta work the same way with programs. Well, in electronic plan review, it really is um, kind of the same. They put, they submit a PDF, we mark it up with red, you know, circle it, comments, things like that. I think what we're moving to in the future is more something that the project docs piece or whatever piece that is can be um, almost, I don't wanna say standalone, but it doesn't matter what that is because it's that how it relates to the the overall finance system and things like that, that we're really gonna be looking at in the in the future. Oh, that'll be but great. The, but the plan review piece is really, it doesn't matter what doesn't system matter. you have, they're all very similar. All right, I don't know if there's any way that, um, like uh, council member Laurentano said, when they submit and they don't complete it, if there's any way that it can send red signals or flag it so that even before they submit it to you, they go back and say, oh, I've missed this, this, this. I mean, is that possible or is that a pie in the sky thought? It's not, and I love that idea. I've talked about that before about like every 24 hours, if something doesn't happen, yeah. we almost ping them. And maybe we say, gosh, after the third ping, we hear nothing it's closed. I think that's a great idea. We don't have that today, but again, as we, that's why it's important to kind of roll this out with the project docs update, because if there's anything that we can do to help, help the customer be successful, again, I don't want this to seem at all punitive. This is something that will help them in the end. And it may be a little difficult to adjust to, but in the end, it's going to make the whole system so much better. So yes, thank you for that idea. And I think that some of these engineers are working on more than one project and more than one city mm -hmm. and each city is different. And I think the more that we can either red flag them or, or highlight it or something to help them so that in their busy day, it, right. it's easier for them to just check the boxes and then they know they're complete. But it is very time consuming for your staff to continually have to look at the same plans the same mistakes and it looks like they're not trying to uh, do it right. And I know it's very frustrating and you may reach a point where you need to do a stiff penalty or to tell them to redo it. Mm -hmm. thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Laura. I found your presentation to be extremely interesting and I also appreciated the um, connection with the development forum. I think that was a great approach to engage them and I, and I love their feedback. I also am excited to hear about your plans for technology and, and uh, your, your tagline to build a better Goodyear is just 
Excellent. So I have a couple of questions. When I hear kickback, it almost sounds like a rejection. Is it like a kick? I'm sending it back with a handshake or, you know, just some kind of offer to, to uh, connect with you. So it doesn't, um, it's a, like a personal touch as it were. Well, and again, um, that is the, the kickback was the uh, word that actually the development community used. But yeah, I mean, again, that's part of our um, evolution to figure out how this process is exactly going to work. We do not want to make it um, an un ever an unpleasant experience. We Everyone that comes to the city and submits to the city, we want them to be successful. So whatever we can do to help them, whether it's, um, hey, we're going to have to turn these plans back, and here's your checklist for a grading and drainage plan sheet, and here's for your water and sewer for your report. These are the things that you're going to need to provide us. If you want, there's a little space where you can check all along. And so we're going to try to give them everything they need in order to get a submittal. I mean, we've even talked about maybe we have them fill these out and submit them with the checklist. But they, we did do that at one time and we found that people became maybe a little lackadaisical and would just check it without actually doing it. So how do we make it meaningful? Great. Now, would a third review ever be warranted for types of projects that we've never seen here before? I mean, with, I mean we've get, we're attracting so many different types of businesses and industries. Would there ever be would you foresee uh, something so different from anything we've done might require additional without, without penalty or? Oh, absolutely. I don't think this is a, um, just a one solution fits all. Okay. And have you identified any particular firms or entities that perhaps might, you might be proactively engaging them prior to uh, implementing our plan just so that there's a nice handoff? You don't have to say. <laughs> And, and I would say that that I, as well as the mayor, have been in meetings with um, with firms where we were having some some good discussion. Okay, great. And then lastly, is there any liability for us as the city for faulty plans? Yes. Okay. I mean, ultimately, we want to make sure that um, it meets the engineering standards, it meets the building code. Uh, we're reviewing them to the best of our ability. The, the professional registrant mm -hmm. is the primary liable person. But again, I, I'm not sure if uh, Rorick wants to jump in here, but there is some um, ownership we have in that process. Okay. Well, I definitely appreciate your commitment to the continuum process, but also the, the customer service aspect. Mm -hmm. Roy, would you like to? Uh, I think she would like you to, so if you have a. No, that's no? okay. Is that fine? Okay. <laughs> All right. Brandon? Yeah, I'm going to reiterate some of what everybody else said as well. So I do appreciate you bringing it up because I don't want to necessarily waste our staff's energy and just repeat, repeat um, plan reviews. So I do appreciate, appreciate you bringing this forward so we can hopefully make it a better process going forward. And, but to your point, it sounds like you, as long as there's some leeway in the process, I think that's important. Like I said, some of the bigger ones, there had to be a few more reviews on them that came recently. So I'd hate to, I don't know, sour relationship or, or something happens where we need to be more flexible. So, um, but it's not like you're already planning on doing that. And then also my other concern is just, I guess a small, a small business, if someone's starting something small and they don't have the resources like a major developer does, just so they, but it sounds like you have good checklists and things like that so they can figure out the process if they're, I wanna open up a restaurant in Goodyear or I wanna do something smaller in Goodyear to be able to, yeah. to still have the leeway and the flexibility and still the help to do that. But, um, but yeah, so I appreciate that you have the flexibility in there. I do like the electronic, procedures, I hope that'll be a lot better streamlined and a lot of help for our end users as well. And then how long does it usually take to get a meeting? If I want, if I was a new business and I wanted to get a meeting with staff, is there, because I mean, there's a lot of things going on in the city, I'm sure you guys can't drop everything for everybody who wants to come in. You would so. be amazed. Okay. <laughs> we, um, we can have meetings if there's availability as quick as that day. Um, oh. We had a request on Friday and Steve and I met with them today. I mean, it was a phone call. Okay. 
but we responded. And, and it really does depend on what's already on our calendar and how many different people need to be. So if it has to be um, Randy, Katie, Christopher, me, Steve, legal, maybe it'll be a week out. Okay. But if it's just a couple of us, we're pretty nimble with being able to squeeze in some time for a 30 minute phone call or a meeting. Now, one thing that you mentioned, I just want to make sure I understand. So um, there was a question about if there's a larger project that we've never seen before that's very unique. Will be and, and when I say we'll be flexible, that means that it could be a design we've never seen. Yeah. It's something, but um, the recent projects that we've um, been working on were not unique, and they um, the plans were of poor quality. But we continued to work with them on that. Whereas, if we were to implement something like this, we might, instead of working with them, kind of kick it out and say, yeah. "Hey, here's some here's some additional information that will help you be successful at your next submittal." Okay. Yeah, and I don't know. I mean, which way the best way is? I mean, if you even if you kick it out, I mean, they're still going to come back to us, and they're still going to want, we're still going to work with them anyway, depending on. I mean, the, how the plans work out. I mean, either way, they're going to get to the end goal if you kick it out right away or if you have two or three submittals. It sounds like they're going to keep submitting until they get what they need to get done through the process. So absolutely, the end result is going to be essentially the same because we want to not have new staff's time exor exor or a lot of staff's time. In right, there. right. The, the end result will be the same. Instead of the first submittal maybe having 100 comments, maybe it only has 30 because they followed all the checklists and did all the different things that they needed to do. Yeah. Absolutely. And then I think that was it. Yeah, I do appreciate you guys trying to streamlining and, and making it better for you guys, and then it ends up, ends up being better for the, the employees and also the customers. So thank you. For sure. Thank you. I greatly appreciate it. When I first got on council in 2005, I was allowed to go and sit, community development was called then, around the table when customers came in. And so um, I did several of them. And at that time, the one thing that I said, when they left, I don't think they understood exactly what it is they needed to do. Um, there wasn't the list like we have now, and there wasn't the moment when they said now, um, can we just talk about this and what did I say to you and, and where are you going to go? And that makes a world of difference uh, because that's where mistakes happen. And I can remember some incidences um, where they had an engineer who placed uh, something in the wrong place um, and had to remove it. So uh, there are things that uh, happen in this business and I seen it when I was in the housing business, but it's very important that we give good service and we weren't giving the best service. And what we're doing here is trying to give the best service. I see anybody that walks to the door, any department calls me and says this developer wants to see me, this uh, builder wants to see me, this person, wants, I meet with people all the time and I, I meet their schedule if I'm doing something else, I rearrange it so I can meet with them and they can ask any of the questions they want to ask. The one thing I can't say to them and never do, I can't give your opinion. I can give them what we have been doing, but I can't talk for you. So I think all of this, and the one thing you missed is time is money. And many of these developers and builders have bridge loans. And so if they get to the end, and the time is up, and we could have prevented it by saying to them, you need to do this and this and this and this. They're busy with things all day long when they're in these developing these big, big patches and big land. And so they need to be urged, and they need to make attention that this needs to be done. It's the amount of money that they're putting into a project, and we would feel like, oh, we can't talk to them because they're you know, we have to let them kind of do their thing. Well, do their thing isn't always right because they do their thing in different states, uh, in different places, and everybody, even different cities are different. So I think here we've said from the very beginning we were going to start giving good service in all the departments, and we've done that. We've recreated everything staff has, and it's marvelous. And this is the one area I totally believe that we needed to improve. So 
that doesn't bother me uh, at all. And I can say that with great pleasure that we're going to benefit them and we're not going to, it's not going to be a, a negative effect. And it all started with a continuum. And when you started this continuum and it became successful, look at the, look at the business we have. Look at the manufacturing companies we have. Look what Goodyear has. There is a reason for that. And staff and what the changes are is that reason. So that's why I said I applaud you. Any other questions? All right. Thank you very much. Now you're Thank on. You. Now, this is the one we've all been anticipating with great vigor. Um, and so what we're going to do is that we're going to hear the update on the Goodyear Recreation Campus. And Nathan Torres, Park and Recreation Director, is present. And you will introduce your other that you have with you, Nathan? Yes, I will, Mayor. Yeah, thank you. Oh. <laughs> all right. Good evening, Mayor and Council. We are excited to provide an update on the Recreation Campus this evening. I'm joined by an extraordinary team, uh, members of the Parks and Recreation Advisory Commission, uh, the Arts and Culture Commission. We have cross-departmental city staff, our, our, our um, design consultants who have just been fantastic, Kim Lee Horn, as well as our architects, DWL, who have been uh, phenomenal uh, to work with throughout this process. Uh, I'm joined at the table uh, by Gailen Oslansky, our Arts and Culture Administrator, as well as Mike Beadle, our Recreation Superintendent. Mayor and Council, this, this journey uh, has been in the making for the past several years. Um, in 2014, Council adopted the Parks and Recreation Trails and Open Space Master Plan. Uh, this community-driven plan identified the need for additional parks and recreation facilities, including a community park, a recreation center, and an aquatics facility. In addition to the last uh, several citywide citizen satisfaction surveys, residents indicated that maintaining and improving parks and providing more recreational opportunities is a top funding priority. It is this community-driven foundation, along with Council's strategic goals, that are at the very basis for this effort. The past two years, we have, been, uh, we have conducted extensive community outreach involvement uh, in master planning and design of the recreation campus. In all, we've engaged with well over 1,100 residents, stakeholder groups, as well as several city commissions, including uh, Parks and Rec Commission, Arts and Culture, the Youth Commission, as well as Planning and Zoning. Uh, tonight, we're happy to share the fruits of this effort as we move from the design phase into the construction phase, um, and ultimately towards an opening uh, by summer of 2021. Uh, but before we get started, I would like to reflect upon your guiding thoughts and visions that you shared with me during the early phases of the master planning process. So these are your words, Mayor and Council. Do it right. That's right. Multifunctional and versatile. Community driven. Community focused. Multi generational. Opportunities for all ages and abilities. Walking paths and trails. The wow factor. Don't forget those teens. Circulation and site connection, engaged public art, a destination for year-round use, ADA-friendly accommodations, the ultimate gathering place, and lastly, a jewel for the city. And Mayor and Council, I feel strongly that we have delivered upon that vision. Um, the recreation campus is truly like no other. Now, it's, it's not like no other because it has over-the-top amenities, because it does, certainly does not. But it is like no other because of the relationships 
in which we have laid the site out to uh, ensure that guests and residents visiting the site can interact with the different amenities without cross-secting with vehicular traffic. It's like no other because we're bringing a mecca of recreational facilities to one location. So there's something for everyone. Um, it's like no other because we really challenged our design team to come up with non-traditional ways in delivering customary amenities, looking at different approaches, approaches to how play happens in the playgrounds, um, how fields are laid out, um, and how uh, plaza space can be designed uh, to accommodate um, different types of gatherings and versatility. And so that is what makes it like no other. And with that, if you're ready, uh, we'll go ahead and take you on a journey through the, through the site. Uh, we're going to start things off with the Recreation Center. It's located in this section here. And I'm going to toss it to Guileen to start that process. Great. Thank you, Nathan. All right, we're gonna begin here with this beautiful image of this desert sky. Um, as you can imagine, a 30 acre park, a recreation center, aquatics facility, public art, these are a lot of pieces that need to come together. And one of the big, the main goals at the beginning was we wanted all this to be very cohesive, all these elements to come together as one whole. And one way to do that is in your color palette. And so for this project, we're looking at a desert sky color palette. You know, you have West Valley sunsets. There's nothing more beautiful than a West Valley sunset. So we have the vibrant colors that you see in the sunset, but you also have the natural elements that you see in our natural landscape and in the materials that are there. Um, you know, as we get, I'm going to be taking you through the exterior of the recreation center. And, you know, PowerPoints are great to illustrate a point, but sometimes they don't fully give you the full fill of a material. And so we do have some samples of materials. We're going to walk those around as I'm going through some of the elements that you're going to see in the exterior. Um, I also do encourage you at the conclusion of the presentation, if you'd like to get up and take a closer look to those materials, please feel free to do, to, do so because some of them are very exciting. All right, so some technical difficulties there, but we've got it now. So what we're looking at here is we have two perspectives of the same building. This is the recreation center. We have a southwest perspective, which this is your view if you're traveling southbound on Australia Parkway, what you'd see at like Australia Parkway in Harrison. Um, and then we have a northwest perspective. This is what you would see northbound Australia. This is a view of like if you were in the park, approaching the recreation center, because this is where the entry doors are. But we're gonna begin up here at our southwest perspective of the building. And so I'm gonna start with my favorite material on the whole entire building. And it's this large area that we see that has, this is a metal finish. It's a nice smooth finish. The way this is finished is it has a polychromatic appearance to it. And what that means is it's color changing. So this paint is not just one color. Diana's going to be our Vanna White tonight, and she's going to walk around, and she's going to move this material. Because what you're going to see with this color is it goes from maroon <laughs> to copper to, to like the, the dark greens of a cactus to the vibrancy of a Palo Verde tree. Um, it is an amazing material. It is the wow. It, it changes by how the light hits it. It changes on what position you see this color at. A motorist is going to have a different experience than a pedestrian. And what is really cool is it's unexpected. It's something that we don't have in Goodyear. And every time you go past our recreation center, you're going to have a different experience and see something different. So it's a really beautiful material that we're really excited to have at the front of the building as this bold approach when you see it from the roadway. Um, moving on from our polychromatic material, um, I want to talk a bit about the block. And um, Vanna's working her way that direction. 
And the block is, it, it's a very neutral finish. It, it's something that our architects really looked at our building and they wanted our building to have a timeless appearance. That block is very heavy. Nathan, Nathan's getting in his exercise today. There we go. Um, this block has a, a nice neutral finish to it. It's very much complementary to the environment. And like I said, it's going to be this timeless finish to the building. So 15, 20 years from now, this building's still going to look great. Um, it really complements the colors that will be around those materials. Perfect. Now, we call moving. that integral block at Pebble Creek. That's our Integra block. Is it? Mm -hmm. it? It's really got a beautiful finish. It's nice. It's it's warm, but and it, like I said, it's very complementary to the colors. Now, the next place that I want to talk about an aesthetic enhancement is on this corner of the building in the southwest perspective. You see, we have an exterior staircase there. It's needed for safety, and we wanted to be able to screen that staircase but we wanted to do it in a beautiful way and to provide another aesthetic enhancement to the building. So you can see in this perforated steel that you, you, know, you get that dot pattern. So this is a now, another texture that's on the outside of the building. Um, it's great that if you're on the stairs, you're gonna be able to see out through that. But from the exterior looking at that, it's an aesthetic enhancement on the building. Now the final thing that I would like to point out before we move to the Northwest exposure is windows. Um, you know, I windows are in all buildings but what the windows do for us from a design perspective is they they actually fulfill multiple roles for us one from the exterior they're reflecting the environment around you they're going to reflect the blue of the sky the landscaping and they're going to complement this building with again wanting to be complementary to that natural environment the windows also have been strategically placed throughout this building so that if you're on the interior of this building, you're capturing the beautiful Australia Mountains. You're getting to look into this beautifully designed park. And they're really providing these view corridors for the people on the interior of the building to see out at the beauty around them. The final thing that I really like about these windows and what they do for this building is it provides us a nighttime experience that's different than daytime. When you drive past this recreation facility at night, you're gonna have that warm glow of light in there and it gives you a peek into what's happening in the facility. I mean, how great will it be on the corner here? There's gonna be a game going on in the gym and you drive by and you're gonna see the people in there playing that game. You're gonna see the people on the walking track. And really that's what this facility is about. It's about the people that are inside using it and, and having a great time, you know, being active. And at nighttime, you're gonna be able to see that. Now we're gonna move here to our Northwest perspective of the building. Like I said, this is where we enter the building. And you're gonna notice the building on this side is more understated. It is more neutral finish. Um, this is because there's a lot of bold design elements that are gonna be on this side of the building. The aquatics facility that Nathan's gonna talk more about here in a little bit. We have the entry into the building. So we want the building to be more of a backdrop now to what these design elements are. This finish that we are showing you will be on the metal, I'm gonna use the pointer here, right up here at the top of the building. And it is a gray tone, but it is a metallic finish. And the purpose of that metallic finish is so that it will play with light and shadow. When the sun hits that, you're gonna have a different look as shadows come. Um, it's not as dynamic as the color changing that's on the front, but it will also pick up some reflections of the colors that are around it as well. And so it provides that beautiful backdrop to the other things that are happening in the park. Um, and with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to Nathan. He's gonna take you on a virtual tour of the interior of the building. All right, thanks, Kyleen. All right, so back to the, to the site plan as uh, let's take a look inside the facility. Um, this is the park entrance here and this is the floor plan. So it's 48, approximately 48,000 square feet. Uh, this is uh, the first floor, approximately 32,000. Uh, with uh, 16 or 15 or 16,000 on the second floor. Um, if you take this second floor and move it over the first floor, it will come right over this area. And it's a, it's a great fit. Um, so let's take a look inside. How, how far around is it to walk? Uh, so the walking track is 10 times around equals a mile. So it's a, it's a fairly um, <coughs> large indoor track. So 
So here's, um, if we're looking outside from the park, looking into the building, that's uh, this perspective here. Um, and as you enter the building, you will see our information desk to the left. Um, you'll see the teen activity center uh, to the right, um, as well as the teen activity, uh, activity center depicted here. Um, one of the key features, uh, when you enter the lobby, we, we talk about a wow factor, and you can actually, actually look up and see the uh, people using the running track or walking track on the second level. So you come into the facility and you can actually see um, people walking or use, utilizing the track. It's, it's definitely pretty special. Um, as we continue through the library, again, the, the, the teen space is on the right. Um, and this hallway here takes you out to the deck of the aquatics area. Um, but there are also two uh, locker rooms and, sh and shower areas for uh, both men's and women's um, to our left here. Um, and those also lead directly out to the deck. Um, but to the right, we have two multi-purpose rooms. And uh, these rooms are about 1,000 square feet. To give an idea in relationship of size, uh, this room is approximately 3,000 square feet. So it's about a, each room, one of these rooms here is approximately one third of this space. Um, and so we anticipate that these rooms will be used for bunko and senior card games. And then uh, we're gonna flip the room and have uh, tot time and, and tot type activities that are depicted there. Um, maybe in the evening, there's a homeowners association meeting that's being conducted in the space. Um, the cool thing about this room is this wall is detractable. Uh, are retractable and so that um, we can create one larger space as well with the two rooms. So we're, we're quite excited about how those rooms are coming together. Um, we also have one large multi-purpose room and this room is approximately 3,000 square feet. So it's about the size of this entire chamber that we're in this evening. Um, but we anticipate being able to accommodate larger type functions or social activities, whether it's graduation parties, um, weddings, um, corporate events. Um, one of the cool signature features, and we talk about multi-purpose and flexibility as possible, is that through these these uh, the, these glass doors here, they're actually retractable, and when they open up, they go into a private lawn area, kind of like you see in the uh, right uh, depicted in the right uh, lower right picture here. Um, so imagine an event having indoor outdoor space that's connected. Uh, and the types of possibilities that exist there. Uh, we're, we're quite excited about that. And so as you continue down the corridor, um, we get to one of the signature features, which is the multi-purpose gymnasium. Um, now the gymnasium, when I say multi-purpose, it truly is multi-purpose. Um, everything from basketball, youth volleyball, adult volleyball, um, you know, indoor badminton, uh, dodgeball, summer recreation site. Um, don't forget the pickleballers. We cannot forget the pickleballers uh, in those summer months. Um, and one of the things that uh, we've been very careful with is the f selecting the floor. Uh, so making sure that the floor is multi-use as possible so that it performs well enough for to handle recreational type sporting activities, uh, but also is versatile enough that we can drag tables and chairs across it without damaging it. So we can set up larger functions in this space as well. One of the other key signatures of the gymnasium is you see the elevated walking track that's, that's going uh, over the top here of the, of the gymnasium. So let's take a look at the second floor and specifically uh, the walking track, which we are all excited about. Um, so here's some renderings and some concepts for the walking track. So um, these are some different views. It gives you a view down into the, into the gymnasium. This probably, these, these two here on the bottom are probably my, my best views. Um, you have, remember we talked about being able for, uh, from the lobby to, to peek up and see people utilizing the track. Well now, um, they can actually look down into the lobby, and that, that's a cool, uh, uh, definitely a cool feature. Um, one of the other uh, views from here, which is notable, are there's windows that go across here, and so that's the beautiful park um, that, that uh, users of the track will be able to look out upon and see that vast uh, open space. Um, so we're pretty excited about, about these views and how this is coming together. 
we also have uh, some fitness area space. Now, our approach always has been that, that we are creating a recreation center, but we're not trying to compete with uh, the LA Fitnesses or the EOS type uh, uh, private facilities. Uh, they do very well and, and we want them, we don't wanna compete with, uh, uh, with that market. They're already serving that need. Uh, however, we will offer very basic um, fitness cardio uh, machines as well as um, uh, selectorized or s circuit training machines um, uh, in this space. So we're pretty excited about that. Again, this is a stretching area. Um, these people are, are actually looking down into the gymnasium, and then you see the, the, walking, the walking track going across this way here. There are also two fitness rooms at, on this level. And so the fitness rooms will accommodate uh, everything from spinning class to yoga sessions or to Council Member Hampton training for his, his ninja uh, event here. So, um, so again, we're, we're excited about this space. We, we've separated uh, multi-use from the facility, you know, where you have activities and programs taking place uh, downstairs and then upstairs will take care of the, the fitness offerings. And so that's a tour of the recreation facility, recreation center. Um, now we're gonna continue to the aquatics facility. And so the aquatics facility is, sits here. Can we stop a moment there? Ellen? Yes. Any questions about what you've seen so far? I have a question. Yes, Molly. Is there a kitchen on the first floor? Uh, there's not a kitchen. We will have a warming area. Because if we're gonna rent out the room, the caterers have got to have a place to bring that food in and maybe reheat it or whatever. So that would be a great revenue source for us. I know your kitchens are extremely expensive, but we just need to keep that in mind, please, so that we can accommodate those folks that do want to rent it for a wedding and then have the facility available. That's a great point, Mayor, uh, Council Member Campbell. Um, the, that large room uh, yeah. does have a warming kitchen and so and while, you can't, while you can't sink. cook in it, it does have a sink, it does have a freezer, oh, and it good. has a table and serving space um, that's created uh, so caterers can come in, Perfect. stage their food, plug in their warmers, and, and serve that way. Wonderful. That's a great point. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Brandon? No, I, I think it's great. I like everything about it, so I'm pretty excited about it. Is the, also is the, um, this is all, the start this is we used to have one like couple phases at one point we were talking about this is all in the first go correct? this is all uh phase one correct Forty eight thousand square foot rec center okay. 30 acre park and the aquatics facility so could okay. you just for the public to know what the acreage is the second half of all of this correct so let me yeah i just clarify because i know at one point we were talking about the the running track would be like a different phase and different things like that. Thank you. I thought you had Thank that you. in the next presentation. I didn't mean Yeah, so I, I can just briefly touch on it, Mayor, if that's okay. okay. Right. So phase one is uh, this entire 40 acres. Uh, the, the entire property is approximately 84 acres in totality. Um, so we are developing the Western 40. It includes a 30 acre park, a 48,000 square foot recreation facility and, a, um, and an aquatics facility. I was just clarifying because I know during the process we had talked about like the running path maybe being a second phase of it, the water aquatic being a little different, and Correct. I just just for the public and everybody, I'm excited about it all. So I Absolutely. want it all now. Yeah, this is so, all yeah. uh, this is all <laughs> phase one. Yeah, thank you. Yep, thank you. All right. So taking a look at whoa. All right. So taking a look at the aquatic facility. Um, we have a competition, a recreation competition pool and activity pool. And when I say recreation, it's 25 yards. Um, it can accommodate up to high school level competition as well as all of our recreation type programs. Uh, we specifically did not program a 50 meter Olympic size pool. Um, the YMCA, who are, they're our partners, they have that offering and uh, we help support that effort. And so again, we don't wanna duplicate uh, service offerings. So we strategically decided to go with the 25 uh, yard pool. These are the types of activities, whether it's swim lessons, um, you know, open swim, lap swim, 
uh, other types of hoops or uh, activities will take place in, in the lap pool. And then we also have the family fun play area. This area is very exciting. Um, so it features a zero depth entry. Um, so zero depth entry is, is basically a beach like entry into the water. And uh, so uh, beach like entry, zero depth into the water, there will be a play structure that we are working on what that will look like at this point. Um, but plenty of play and splash features, uh, very ADA friendly. Um, so we're very excited about this space. It will go from zero depth up to about three feet, about three feet in the play area. Um, there's also a lazy river. And so you can uh, jump on an inner tube and, and float down the lazy river. Um, you're also able to, um, we're also able to use that lazy river outside of open swim for aerobics and where you can actually uh, walk against the current to get a, to get a workout. Um, in the background here, you see uh, two slides. Those are 27 feet uh, high slides. Uh, the platform is 27 feet, so it'll feature two different slides with two different user experiences. Um, so one will be a closed flume and the other will be an open flume. Um, and uh, we're very excited about that opportunity as well. Also plenty of opportunities uh, for shade, Ramada space. Um, we spent a lot of time in uh, laying out and designing this facility so that uh, when you have an open body of water, you have to guard it. Uh, but we do realize there, there may be times where we just want the competition pool open or times where we, where we just want the family fun play pool open. And so everything is designed so that we can isolate each area. And so if there are activities going on and just the family fun play pool and, and the competition pool or lap pool is closed, we can isolate that and block that off and vice versa. Um, so a lot of operational efficiencies uh, went into the design. So now we'll kind of take a walk through the park. Um, so again, I mentioned the one of the key features is all the perimeter parking. And so our team from the very early stages, we wanted to make sure that we provided the safest park possible. And so uh, this was our attempt to, to accomplish that. So once you arrive at the park, uh, you or a family member doesn't have to worry about intersecting with any vehicular traffic. So you can roam about the site freely um, and engage the activities without worrying about um, crossing vehicular traffic. Um, one of the mayors and council's comments about paths and trails took that into consideration. Um, by having the perimeter parking, it allowed us to create this dashed red mark that's marked here. Um, that is a, a walking path that goes all along the perimeter of the site. One time around is a mile. And so we're, we're happy that, that we have these uh, facilities all in one location. Um, so that's going to be a great experience. We have a, a great lawn area for activities and, and different types of events. And uh, I don't want to steal Guileen's thunder. I'm going to toss it back to her in a little bit to talk about that. Um, Multi-purpose fields uh, here, they can be used for soccer, uh, like football. They can be used for uh, events. We purposely have placed all the poles on the perimeter of this grass area so that we can set these fields up or activities up without having to have poles in the middle of our activities. Um, we have two full-size baseball softball fields for youth and adults. Um, so um, that will be a, a, a nice feature. Um, and of course, we have uh, six pickleball courts. We have two volleyball courts. We have uh, two basketball courts and two sand volleyball courts in this area. One of the, the, the key features of the park, we talk about providing similar amenities, but in a different way. Um, this area here is, is pretty special. It's a, a group ramada and a play area. I'm going to zoom in a little more here. So this is a, a group of circular ramadas um, that will accommodate uh, groups uh, from as small as 25 people or a max of 125. Um, so if you're having a small party, you can reserve one for 25 or you can reserve all five uh, for 125 people. Um, they have uh, uh, barbecue and cooking areas in the middle to kind of uh, 
uh, encourage dialogue between the user groups and share spices or uh, whatever they, they want to talk about. Uh, look at your neighbor and see what they're cooking and who does it better. Um, they'll be able to do that in this space. Um, one of the key elements here is the, the, the playground space. And our parks and recreation, uh, our park superintendent, Jeremy Figueroa, as we started looking at playground space, um, we were looking at very traditional standard playgrounds. And uh, Jeremy came and said, whatever happened to letting kids just play? How can we spread out um, play so that we can not deal with just congested amenities? Um, and so it was Jeremy's idea that said, why don't we build in some different elevation changes and let kids climb up hills or roll down hills? Or maybe you enter a play feature. Maybe you enter a play feature on a second level and you slide down and you're at a different level. Or vice versa, you enter through a bottom level and you make your way up to a top level. Um, and so we are working through uh, the actual selection of the playground equipment with our Parks and Recreation Commission. Um, they'll be selecting uh, those components uh, next month. But I wanted to give you an example of what that multi-tiered uh, play area will look like. And so um, another key feature here is a circular swing. So you've seen a traditional approach to swings. Um, the circular swing really encourages dialogue and, and, and sharing of, of vis visiting with neighbors. Um, so if you're swinging, uh, and you're swinging directly across from somebody. Um, so we're, we're excited about that space and what that will uh, allow to happen. Um, this also shows um, how, the, how we plan to engage hills in the playground area. Uh, there will be uh, a climbing wall with some climbing elements. Um, there will be some slides um, and then areas just to run up, run down, roll down, and uh, everything will be ADA friendly. So there will be opportunities for um, uh, those needing accommodations to interact and play as well. And so with that, I'd like to end with the last signature feature of the park and I'm gonna turn it over to Guylene to talk about the art plaza. Thank you, All right, so I'm excited to get into the public art. Um, I know you are too. We have some of our arts commissioners here with us this evening that are very excited about this as well. Um, before we dig in, I do wanna show you on the screen here, if I can get the mouse to go around. Once I continue to mess it up. If Jeff can fix it for me in the back, that would be great. Thank you, Jeff. Right here at the center where this says public art, the mouse is kind of jumping around, but right in the middle where it says public art, this is where our art plaza is located, and that is located next to the Great Lawn. And this area is a really dynamic space, and what I wanted to point out to you, it's bouncing all around. What I want to point out to you is the great view corridors that you get from the playground area to the recreation center. You know, the way that you, you're going to view this from as you enter from the parking lots, it's really a central part of the whole entire park and really ties all the space together. Here, yeah, thank you. All right, um, Jeff, could you please cue the video? So um, we have given each and every one of you a kaleidoscope up here, Marin Council, so that um, I want to take you back to when you were a kid and when you picked up a kaleidoscope and you looked through that kaleidoscope and you discovered new colors, new, new patterns, new, new, the way the colors fell together, um, the way the shapes, they're ever changing. Now something was, it was always different where you had this wow factor of how life could be so unique with each turn and each way that you looked, if you looked at the lights, if you looked at something that was more dark, how that all changed. And the reason we're looking at this is because the idea of a kaleidoscope was really the inspiration for the kickoff of our public artwork and our art plaza that you're gonna see. 
The Arts and Culture Commissioners in 2017 came to council with the fiscal year 2018 annual public art plan. And in that art plan, they asked council to, you know, if they could have approval to include public artwork in the recreation campus. And um, they shared that, you know, they wanted this artwork to be different, that they wanted it to be very experience-based. And through that discussion with council, council was very supportive of that, but they also said they really wanted this artwork to be interactive. They wanted this artwork to be something that people engaged in a way that they physically uh, climbed it, touched it, moved it, something happened to it. And I'm excited to be able to share it with you tonight that the Arts Commission was able to deliver on that promise for you. Jeff, could you please return to the PowerPoint? All right, so we are gonna begin by looking at the art plaza itself. This is where the artwork is gonna be located, but I do wanna talk through the plaza before we do our grand reveal of our artwork. And so beginning here, up at the top right corner of this slide, this is, this is the Great Lawn. That green grassy area is the Great Lawn, so you have some orientation of where we're at. Um, this plaza is tiered with the top section where the pointer is being the top, the highest of those tiers. And this area is gonna be great as a gathering space. This provides us an area to program whether there is a, a concert or an art festival or you know, a storytelling event. Um, it really gives us the ability to um, have that point out towards our great lawn or focus towards the center where our public arc is gonna be. Now the next step down is the first area where you start seeing this idea of a kaleidoscope, where you think of that as these patterns and textures. Um, now I do want to let you know that the colors you see on these is just for illustration. The colors are still working on those final colors that are gonna be found in the plaza. But on this second tier, you see this beautiful design that's picking up that pattern of the kaleidoscope. And again, this is a great area for gathering. Um, as we get into the artwork, you're gonna find this is a great area for um, some of the exciting things that are gonna happen with the artwork that's gonna be a view for you. Um, we step down one more tier to the circle. And in this circle area, this is actually where the artwork will be installed and be, be viewed and be able to engage with. And then the final tier is one step down, and this is what we're calling this the terrace area. Um, there is a, a lawn area next to this that's much smaller than our great lawn, but it also <laughs> provides another area that can be programmed depending on the size of the event, the program, or activity that's happening. Now, as I said earlier with the exterior of the building, and this, you know, when you're talking design things, PowerPoints just don't do it justice, and especially for this artwork. So I have, I'm gonna be demonstrating the action. We have a model that I'm gonna reveal, but before I do that, I wanna talk through a few of these elements, and then I would like to illustrate the movement this artwork will have, because this, move, this artwork is very active. Um, when we look there on the left-hand side of the slide, this is the view of this sculpture. The sculpture is 30 foot tall, it will be 28 foot wide, and it is not a static sculpture. This is a kinetic sculpture. It is going to move, and it will move not by wind and not by a motor, but it's gonna have movement by how people move and engage with the artwork. Now before I show that, I do want to share some of the fun things that are going to happen in this artwork. So up on the top right, we have these arcs that are all, they will all move independently and each one of the arcs has a different color, it's called a coda filter, but what it is, it's a color inlay and you can see the palette that's there of the six colors that are going to be used. Um, I want to draw your attention to the bottom right. This is an arbor that is just an example of what a coda filter does as the sun shines through it it projects the color onto the ground. And it does project it as vibrant as you see it there. We've been testing them. Um, we've tested them at the height of the artwork. And you can see in the image of the hand holding the green, the yellow, the vibrancy of the color that you're gonna get. Um, being able to use our environment and use it in our artwork is just a great way to um, you know, make this art even something more special. So um, I'm gonna go ahead, I'm gonna stand up because I wanna demonstrate the artwork. And Jeff, could you cue the Elmo for us? Yeah. 
All right, Mayor and Council. So this was a very early model, just so we could see what could be possible with kinetic art. Um, working with our artists, uh, the Arts and Culture Commission selected Joe O'Connell with Creative Machines. It's a firm out of Tucson. And um, in working with Joe, we found that this will be an artwork like no other. There is no kinetic art, public artwork that we find that is activated at a human scale that people actually can use this in, and, and manipulate the artwork. So I'm going to, as you can see on the Elmo, this, like I said, was the early model, and I want to just get it swinging so you can kind of see how the arcs go in unexpected patterns, how it shifts, how the balance shifts from top to bottom, and each of the arcs will move independently. As you can see on the illustration on the screen, the way that people will engage with this will be with two poles, and the poles will be down up below, and they will rotate, they will move those poles up and down, similar to like a pole pole on a merry-go-round would be my best example of how that movement happens. Depending on how quickly they move the pole, um, if there's one person trying to manipulate it, if there's two people, if there's four people standing there moving, will change the rotation of the arcs, change the speed of the arcs, and change what happens. And as you can see, the scale there, if you're standing underneath this and as this rotates over top of you back and forth, it's going to be a quite dynamic experience. Now, the other thing that, um, Jeff, could we go back to the PowerPoint, please? The other great thing that I'd like to show is that as this color, as the light dances with this, not only do we have people now engaging to manipulate and move the artwork, we also are going to be providing this secondary activity with the artwork. This art plaza was built specifically to really highlight the colors that will be illuminated through the artwork. That's why you have these gray areas, you have some of these colored areas, because as those CODA filters hit, hit each of these, they do different things. Those colors will dance and move throughout there. I mean, I can see kids out there chasing these colors, and it really becomes our canvas that our artwork creates a painting upon that art plaza. Um, at nighttime, we also have a great experience. You know, this is really, the colors I'm talking about is really determined on the sun being out. But at nighttime, we have the way the arcs are created. There is going to be a mirror on the underneath side of the arc and an LED light that's pointed specifically at those. And instead of colors being reflected down the ground, now you're going to have spots of light that, re that reflect down on the ground. That's where our plaza area, this material that you're seeing that's the color, it's called a lithocrete. It's actually pieces of glass, colored glass, and small mirrors that are embedded down the concrete that give a very beautiful finish. So as those lights hit those, it'll sparkle and glitter, and it's going to create this really active space for people in the evening. All right, this is our final view of our artwork. Just again, just to kind of give you a scale of the people next to the artwork. And uh, this would be looking back towards the Recreation Center. Um, with that, I'm gonna turn it back to Nathan. Great. Thank you, Gailene and Arts Commission. All right, Mayor and Council. So next steps, uh, tonight you will consider uh, the rezoning of the site uh, to allow the campus to proceed. Um, next week, uh, at regular meeting, uh, we will be bringing the expenditure authority uh, for council consideration uh, to proceed into the construction phase of the project. Uh, we were planning initially to bring park naming uh, to Marin Council that evening. We have decided to bring that back uh, the first week of September, I believe it's September 9th, via work session. Uh, to allow us to engage council in that process. We've had a dynamic process, uh, uh, public outreach, as well as our uh, Parks and Recreation Commission has been engaged in that, and we want the opportunity to hear your thoughts on that and engage you in that process. Um, so the park naming will not happen on the 26th. We will, we will present that on September 9th. And then, of course, uh, groundbreaking is October 1st. And so we literally... Um, are moving from design into construction, and those are the elements that are upcoming. And so with that, we're happy to answer any questions. Questions, Jerry? I don't really have questions, but I have a statement. Thank you, Nathan, thank you, Gailene, thank you, and thank you for the whole team, the commission and everything. This is just wow. I mean, this is everything we asked for, everything I think our citizens, it's beautiful. The detail, the thoughts, um, just from the, um, 
materials to the sculpture, which I'm, I'm sure you can't even do it justice once we actually see it up and running. I mean, that's just going to be wonderful. The little thoughts about where the playground is as a mom. When I, my kids were little, I liked the fact they're by the soccer field. So if you're watching one kid play soccer or baseball, the kids aren't that far away to the lazy river, to the teen center. I mean, you've just covered it all, indoor, outdoor tracks. I, I don't know what else to say, but thank you guys for your hard work and you've exceeded any expectations. So thank you. Thank you. And if I can add to that, that it really has been a, a true team process from, from the community for one, uh, to the commissions, um, to cross departmental support from nearly every single department. Um, it is a mammoth uh, approach to, to be before you this evening. And I'm just the lucky guy that gets to sit here and present it all. But uh, there's a great deal of participation and uh, props that goes out to the whole city team as well as the commissions and the public. Brandon? Yeah, I'm also very excited about this project. It'll be, I mean, a, a statement for the central part of Goodyear and lots of families are very excited. I just imagine my kids playing there and doing all kinds of different things there and generations of people playing there so like it's like again thank you so much to the whole team and all the effort it'll definitely be a lasting thing that all of our citizens will be using so i'm very very excited i was even showing my family when i was looking through it when we were looking through the different rooms and everything so it's going to be a, an amazing and a great place to to be as a family and then i said a quick question so i do Thank you for bringing the hill. I thought that's that's going to be pretty neat as well. I know it's something I was I was curious about in our in our our meetings. And then, is the grass? I'm sure majority of it's going to be all natural. Is there going to be any element of fake grass as well? Yeah. So there will be some artificial turf spread throughout the facility. Uh, specifically on that hill, uh, we'll need some artificial turf that's under under shade, of course. Um, right because it's tough to, it's to grow grass on, on a hill. Yeah. Um, there yeah. are also other areas um, that are outside of the rec center that will have some artificial turf okay. as well. Yeah, I'm very excited. So thank you to the team, everybody involved. So I think I'm looking really forward to breaking ground. I'm, my kids and I are looking very forward to playing there. So thank you. Laura? You've really created a jewel for the city. I'm so excited. And I was on the Arts and Culture Commission when this uh, was initiated, and we chose the artist. And knowing it was such a big project, it's, it's such a delight to see how far you've come with it. And uh, just the, I especially appreciate the artistic uh, design elements within the building as illustrated by all this good stuff here. That, that's what takes a municipal building and makes it. Uh, extra special. So thank you for the creating a destination. Now, on behalf of all my water uh, conservation commission people, um, I have had inquiries about the turf and, and the water sources. Uh, would it be watered by pot potable water or reclaimed water? Realizing both processes require a process to get it, but can you address that? Yes, I'm ha happy to do so. Um, right now, um, it's scheduled for potable water, um, and uh, the city has taken a different approach in not utilizing uh, reclaimed water for irrigation purposes, and it has more value if it's recharged. Um, and so because of that, it is uh, on a potable source. I will tell you that we have the latest technology um, to ensure that we are watering as efficiently as possible. Um, so, yeah. Molly? Well, Nathan, this really is a playground of dreams. We have dreamed of this and talked of this for over 20 years that I have lived in this city. And um, I'm just thrilled to death for our residents who are really going to enjoy everything about it. I'm assuming that the public art period, or uh, not period, I'm sorry, public art place or location, it's not going to be an amphitheater. Is that correct? It can't be used as an amphitheater. It's going to be multi-use, so we can use it for events. Uh, we can use it uh, in, in that. It's not going to be a dedicated type amphitheater with seating, uh, but very similar to Goodyear Community Park that has uh, a platform with, with an area around it. that where It would be nice to bring the music over there once we get it all done sure. up. That would be great. Sure. And I would just like to encourage you to think about our youngsters that are in wheelchairs and be sure that we have some type of play equipment that is accessible for those youngsters. You 
done a wonderful job to do a zero entrance into the pool so we know all of them can get in and get out very safely. Um, while touring the United States in the last eight weeks, um, I have seen several ex accessible only parks and they are amazing the things that they do have, the swings and even the slides for the children to use with their wheelchairs and it's wonderful. So I know cost is, is um, a factor, but perhaps if we could get one or two things in there, that would be wonderful. And also please consider a cardio machine when you do all the bicycles. Not everyone is fit like Brannon. And there are, uh, we have a large population that do need those cardio machines and they really can't afford to do the LA fitness and that, and that would be wonderful if you could have one or two of those, if you can. Absolutely. So thank you for the great job. It's just, it, it's just extraordinary. Thank you. Joe? Yeah, there's not a whole lot to add to that, except uh, I, I really do like what I see and I'm looking forward to this thing going live. Well, I agree with everything they've added. It's, it's a people's park. Mm -hmm. It definitely is. Um, we, we haven't forgotten one item in this park. And I think he's done it with being very creative and with color and with fun. Um, so I, I can see that this is going to be uh, an entertainment spot for the entire family. So thank you for all your work and thank you for bringing the public into it because we know when they somebody steps foot in there, they're gonna say, oh, that was one of my ideas. That was the color I wanted. Absolutely. That's what, so I think we've been so engaging on this. Um, so congratulations to everybody and also for the artwork. It's, um, you know, everybody looks at something like that. It's modern and it's new, but that's what we need to do. We're moving on, we're a little different now. So any other questions? All right, then I'm going to adjourn this meeting before I do. So it's 6.01, I know we have public hearing. Do we have 10 minutes I can yeah, give them a break? you can take 10 minutes. All right, so I'm going to adjourn this meeting uh, and then we'll say at 6.10, uh, we'll be back at the other meeting. This meeting is now adjourned.